Thank you all for coming and it's um, a pleasure and an honor to be the moderator of today's uh, session uh, with my colleagues here from uh, Kuwait, Doha, Jeddah and Dubai. Um, so in, in summary, the panel brings together young practitioners who are working with archival efforts uh, from all of those countries and we're going to be talking about the challenges that they're facing um, in doing those archival uh, efforts and, and initiatives. So each of the participants work on uh, archiving at a different scale uh, through different mediums using different processes. And um, among the panelists are those who focus on the city while others go uh, beyond the country borders creating different regional connections through their practice. Uh, the processes of archiving differ and are diverse. For example, they are working with oral history, some of them are working with photography, archival drawings, uh, and book collections, and so on. So, furthermore, the medium uh, used to communicate the archival material with the public and the chosen timing to do so can also vary from one uh, practice to another from our speakers. So, uh, unfortunately, um, we have three of our speakers, uh, sorry, two of our speakers present now, and the third is on the way from the airport. We have two joining us uh, on Skype, uh, Fatma and uh, Ali. So I'll give a brief description of each of our speakers, and then uh, each of them will uh, give a presentation. Um, that's very windy. So we'll start with uh, Ahmed. Okay. Do you have the presentation, sir? Are oh, you just speaking? Okay. Right, so we'll start with Ahmed. Um, Ahmed Talib is a property and urban development professional and a branding specialist. He holds a master degree in property development from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, and has more than uh, 11 years of experience in the field. He is currently working with a number of developers on various projects in Bahrain, the Gulf, and the United Kingdom. Uh, he also runs commercial side um, of a Bahraini-based architecture and engineering practice. Alongside his interest in urbanism, architecture, public relief and placemaking, he was um, also a co-founder of Khosh Hosh in 2012-2013 session. Um, and uh, he collaborates with art and cultural institutions on different projects such as a Rawak Street Art Project, Parking Day, and The Nest, among others. So I'll present our first speaker for today, Ahmed. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I don't have any presentation or any visual aid. I'll just keep this short. And this is more supposed to be more of a casual discussion um, between the panelists and the, and the audience as well. Um, just to give you a bit of background, in 2012-2013, um, I co-founded an initiative called Khosh Khosh um, with Sarah Kano, um, which was focused on developing a dialogue basically on the built environment among the citizens and residents of Bahrain. And I was very much focused on Bahrain itself and how we could sort of change things towards, towards having a better built environment around us in terms of public spaces, place making and other initiatives. And that was supposed to be done through urban interventions, uh, documentation projects, archiving projects and some um, exhibitions and talks. Um, through the 2012-2013, as we worked on a couple of projects, we've experienced a few challenges with accessing archive in Bahrain, especially on, on, on matters related specifically to Bahrain. Um, most of the archives are inaccessible and we had a challenge to finding information available here in, in the country. Um, lots of information in Bahrain is actually scattered between the British Library, whatever it was, um, when, at, under the, before 1971 for independence, is actually with the British uh, Library. Some of other material are available here in Bahrain, but it's scattered between uh, the SLRB, the Survey and Land Registration, um, the Ministry of Culture or the Cultural Authority, and, um, municipal, mun and the municipality itself. Um, having multiple points, no proper archiving system, it was always a challenge to get access to information. Actually, um, in one instance, uh, we approached one of the ministries in Bahrain to get information on the public transport. And we called the archive and we were told that everything you get, they burn everything every 10 years. Which was shocking because that then was the point of archiving if you burn everything every 10 years and you don't digitize anything. So 
there are so many challenges when it comes to archiving here in the region, specifically in Bahrain. Um, I think the, the, in, in our situation, what we found out is there is no value of information. People do not value the information, hence they do not care much about archiving, and that's one of the key challenges. Accessibility was one other uh, key thing that we noticed, as I said, it's not available, it's inaccessible. Um, and the challenge we had was documentation moving forward was not basically a task that is taken by anybody. So it was done on a personal basis, initiative basis. There is no proper archiving um, of the current time. And that's in summary what I wanted to sort of highlight. I think I'll leave more for the rest to discuss later. Thank you, Ahmed. Okay, um, I'll present the second uh, speaker who is joining us by Skype, uh, Fatma Sahlawi. She's from Doha. So Fatma is a Qatari architect and urbanist based in Doha. She holds a B.Arch in architecture from the American University of Sharjah in 2009 and an M.Arch in urban design from the University College London, the Bartlett Schools of Arch School of Architecture in 2013. So while being a full-time architect and urbanist at Qatar Museum um, Authority from 2011 to 2014, um, and also while being a full-time uh, architect and urbanist at Qatar Museum Authority, sorry, 2011-2014, Fatma led master planning and architectural projects uh, in cooperation with different planning and cultural entities in Qatar, as well as international uh, consulta consultants. During her time at uh, QMA, uh, she also founded the Doha Architecture Forum in 2012, setting a platform for discourse in local and international architecture and urbanism. Fatma is currently, Fatma is currently running the Atlas Book uh, Store in, uh, in Doha, one that specialized in, uh, is specialized in architecture and urbanism books covering Middle East, North Africa region. She also holds a part-time position uh, of architecture researcher in both uh, the Qatar Museum, um, Museums Authority and uh, Mokwa projects, if I'm spelling this right. So I'll leave it to Fatma now. Uh, some technological uh, issues so I'll be presenting our third speaker who will start now um, okay so uh, Ruda is a co-founder and chief architect of Jidda based architecture office and design think tank urban phenomena design plus research 
The office is a network of architects, interior designers, and visual communication designers who have teamed up to experiment uh, with the Belt environment with satellite offices in Medina and Riyadh. The team works on a range of projects in cities such as Mecca, Medina, uh, Jeddah, Riyadh, and uh, Al-Khubar. I'll leave it short and I'll leave the rest for our speaker to say. Thank you, Dr. Fay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. This is uh, great to be in Bahrain. I'm glad uh, it's nice to be in an outdoor space. Um, I just need, can we hook our... Can we hook it here? Or, yeah, maybe. We need a... Uh, Well, no better place to discuss the built environment than a construction site. <laughs> so kudos to the Mwani team. I'd like to thank them also for Okay, um, I don't know if... Okay, we can, yeah. So I'm talking, I need to be next to my laptop. Let me see. Okay. So I'll just say next. Okay. Um, no, maybe the cover, uh, the cover page. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, our activity in Jeddah uh, regarding archiving, but also documenting uh, the identity of uh, a place, uh, especially uh, an Arab contemporary city like Jeddah. Uh, we we find a lot of common denominators between um, modern Arab cities in, 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 in the region, also common uh, aspects with Gulf cities, even though Jeddah uh, technically is not on the Gulf, uh, it's part of the Gulf realm, let's say, of, of urban cities, and they um, uh, went through the same uh, factors. Um, in our uh, effort to define uh, Jeddah, we try to always give it this um, keyword. Um, as you all know, Jeddah is actually the gateway, or called so-called so gateway to the holy mosques, Mecca and Medina. And we try to read into that uh, title and how we can find aspects of this. Um, recently, though, we've 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 tried to shy away. Gateway has become a bit too cliche, and hence we called. Uh, Jeddah now an intermediary city, and I'll explain why. Um, so, um, part of our, um, of the reasons why we want, we think it's very important to uh, document or uh, the contemporary Arab city or mapping its cultural identity is uh, the challenge we faced. First of all, uh, working in a, in a city that has become very hard to connect with the context. Uh, as you know, if a lot of people here are architects, uh, when you're trying to design a building, um, you're always looking for some cue from the city or context to, to relate to, and that you can develop your concept of our team. Um, in a lot of cases, especially with uh, cities that have witnessed uh, rapid growth and oil boom and, and so forth, uh, that was a, uh, one of the biggest challenges to, to do that. Uh, so we thought, okay, well, al along our design uh, work, we would also try to analyze and maybe uh, document some of uh, Jeddah's uh, conditions. and. Th that led to what we call mapping the cultural identity of a place. Next, please. Um, now, uh, a lot of people have written about the problems uh, facing uh, uh, cities in the region, um, and we kind of defined maybe two types of cities: cities that have a very strong uh, historical heritage, such as Cairo, Baghdad, Damascus, for example. Um, I highly recommend reading Dr. Yasser Chishtaw's uh, book, uh, rightly entitled The Middle East City Moving Beyond the Narrative of Loss. I've, I'm sure if you've stayed for a while in the region, there's always this uh, uh, 
call that we've all been on the receiving side and as Ahmed, I was chatting with Ahmed, we kept we just keep complaining and complaining and complaining. Uh, Dr. Shishtawi says, well, okay, it's time to move on. What are the problems? Let's tackle them and deal with them. Now, he highlights, uh, now, in a lot of uh, countries where uh, colonialism was um, present, that was usually the scapegoat. Oh, Al-Mustamir, Al-Mustamir, we had all those problems from Al-Mustamir. Well, what about us? There was no Istamar here, for example. Um, what happened to our cities? So he defined them as um, globalization. So now we're dealing with, rather than colonialization, this global globalization, which in a way we are um, um, complacent with, that we brought that um, um, global aspect. Uh, next, please. Uh, the problem is, and of course, why cities, as we know, I, I don't need to advertise how important cities are in terms of economy, congregation of people, and the possibilities uh, that take place their intense uh, gatherings of uh, individuals. Next, please. Um, now, um, unfortunately, though, it seems uh, we inspired a lot of our uh, research from uh, the book Learning from Las Vegas by uh, Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi. Um, now, modernism or mo early modern architecture was in a way a reaction to certain specific uh, conditions that took place in Europe, uh, layers of history, layers of, of, of social, cultural uh, movements and agitation. However, uh, they, in, back in the 70s, in the US uh, cities, after, of course, all that uh, car-driven uh, expansion of, um, of cities, they realized that the, the, the modern revolution has been prolonged for too long. We haven't mo moved since the 20s and 30s. We still deal with the same issues. And hence, they thought, let's go to the current cities as they are and learn from them. And hence, the title of it's actually a studio for students called Learning from Las Vegas. Um, now, what happened to us is uh, what we call, I would call, a landscape of abundance. Uh, oil boom is one of the major uh, players there. Suddenly, where in the past uh, it was easier to read the local vernacular, local vernacular architecture, because it was a reflection of uh, something we can comprehend, climate, uh, population, geography, these factors created uh, a distinct and easy to uh, delineate uh, vernacular architecture. Suddenly, after the oil boom, rapid expansion, rapid development, uh, so many factors came to play, we cannot now define, if you ask someone, what is Bahraini architecture now, not the historic, it's very hard to, uh, uh, to answer that question. The same questions we couldn't answer in Jeddah, what is the Jiddawi architecture or a Meccawi architecture? in a contemporary sense. Now, unfortunately, during the 80s and, and maybe early 90s, there was always this the postmodernism movement tried to copy and take uh, bits and pieces, but it was all pastiche, didn't work, unfortunately, and it became just a fad. Uh, so, the main uh, task here is to go back and, and analyze the context and try to document and redefine or define actually this new vernacular based on all these new uh, factors, economical factors, social factors, of course, across uh, cultural exchanges. Um, why cultural identity? Uh, simply because if you cannot connect with you with the, the identity of a place or a context, uh, you end up with soulless buildings that could work anywhere and they really don't help in uh, adding to the cultural heritage or national heritage of a place we all know unfortunately this is also a practice issue architecture is now engineering unfortunately and there's no uh, aspect uh, of expressing not necessarily just this, the architects but actually the whole community he represents or they represent next please so, um, our uh, laboratory was uh, the city of Jeddah, it's a big city, very big metropolis, and now it's about 4 million uh, uh, residents, so a lot of things uh, to take in, 
uh, it started as one square kilometer until the 1940s, uh, being mainly just the port for pilgrims going to Mecca or Medina. Plus, of course, there was a bit of trade, and it was on the route to uh, Mediterranean and Egypt, of course. Um, next, please. And uh, prior to the boom that is now uh, have taken place in the Gulf back in maybe the 60s and 70s, there was this initial, I think Kuwait was probably uh, a similar uh, example where early uh, modern ideas came uh, to take place, funded of course by the oil boom at that time. Um, next please. Uh, so uh, there was a very good vision with a lot of international architects coming to work in, uh, in Jeddah. This is one of our uh, most famous, and actually we're, we're very proud of it, the design by SOM, the Hajj Terminal. Anyone who passes by Jeddah will definitely see it. It's roughly one square kilometer, the largest uh, man-made covered um, uh, roof. Next please. Um, international architects, Kenzo Tange was there. Uh, he did the guest palace for the royal um, guests of the royal, uh, sorry, of the government in Jeddah in 1982. Next, please. Uh, SOM also designed the National Commercial Bank, now a uh, landmark, just very new to the palette, also a beautiful uh, piece of architecture. Next, please. And uh, the mayor of Jeddah at that time, from 1976 to roughly 1984, uh, the only mayor who was an architect, uh, engulfed in an ambitious project to have uh, an open air museum along the Corniche of Jeddah, um, uh, beautiful, and with a lot of international uh, sculptors and artists, Henry Moore, Miro, Cesar, amongst others. Uh, now, part of our work is documenting all the official, let's say, or formal architecture of Jeddah, where our, our, our aim is to produce a, uh, a guide, an architectural guide to the city of Jeddah, which I think every city in the Gulf needs to do. Um, next, please. However, well, we realize as, as practitioners, though, uh, it's nice if you're a visitor to visit these beautiful pieces of architecture and then you leave, but when you're living there and trying to uh, figure out uh, what the identity is, we realize a lot of places, uh, um, it, it seems like Jeddah has gone through a, um, an illness and somehow via friends in the medical background, we realize that Jeddah suffers from what was called chronic fatigue syndrome. And if you read the definition of chronic fatigue syndrome in the medical, it says nothing. It just says it's very technical for you being tired or you don't know, you don't know what happened and realize that's uh, what's taking place in Jeddah. I mean, everybody's, I think Bahrain probably has uh, something similar from what I see, but uh, on that in Jeddah, it's, it's a really big scale. Next, please. Um, so we realized, uh, this is a good essay by uh, Shunan Basar from uh, Cities from Zero, mainly described in Dubai, but we realized a lot of similar things taking place. Um, um, a lot of what we call geographies of exclusion and landscapes of wealth, whereas every architecture is just on its own, uh, gives its back. There is no public um, uh, spaces, there is no urban uh, initiative to kind of integrate and weave your urban fabric into a, 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 a unity of, of, or let's say, of some sort. The next piece. Um, now we realized why a lot of this took place because after the initial boom, there was you know beautiful and a simple vision, economies of scale just entered and uh, you know in a, in in a sense municipalities just could not cope with all this rapid growth and they just had to uh, even the infrastructure was barely uh, keeping up. Um, already by the 1990s, uh, worldwide, uh, Jeddah was probably third in terms of. Uh, growth as a city, 5.1 nearly per annum, which is really big. Only China now, in, in the 2000s, reached these uh, figures. Next, please. Um, the population in 60 years um, increased a hundredfold, so 
that's that's a lot of uh, infrastructure to deal with. And as I said, from one square kilometer, Jeddah is now roughly 650 square kilometers in in area to administer uh, urban area, not uh, even um, a rural area. So next, please. Um, unfortunately, with a lot of Im immigration from regions around Saudi Arabia. Um, a lot of unplanned settlements, uh, roughly, uh, what surprised us a lot also, 40% of Jeddah's residents live in unplanned settlements. Next, please. Um, and you can see the difference in density. 72 um, persons per hectare is a good average in most Gulf cities. In these unplanned settlements, 325 persons per hectare. Next, please. Um, to a point where we think uh, it has even affected how people relate to their city and uh, a syndrome, I think we should maybe um, uh, consult our medical um, colleagues, what we call urban apathy. People now really, in the old places, your uh, Farij or Hara, as we are now, and we have, uh, was part of you. Uh, you would uh, take care of it, you couldn't do anything to it because everybody was in it together. Now you have urban apathy, you throw whatever you want to do, you, no one really, uh, unless you're caught, and, uh, and that's a serious thing. Unfortunately, that's why um, the architect and the city now um, is not really welcoming, there's no warmth, uh, and, and we feel that in Jeddah. Next please. Um, as Ahmed was saying, yes, documenting not an easy process. There is there is no national archive for, for the built environment. Uh, we're hoping through these little initiatives, books, publications, blogs, uh, and for us coming to Bahrain and seeing uh, like-minded people doing the same thing, this is for us uh, one of our uh, targets. Um, all our efforts, all our efforts are just our own initiative. We try to do it when we have time between projects, uh, but we always try to um, highlight them and their importance to uh, clients, to friends, to anyone in uh, the industry, but also even uh, any resident who really wants to feel uh, or wants to uh, connect with his urban context. Next, please. So. Um, a lot of this was inspired from research done elsewhere um, through my studies in Japan. We worked with a professor called Ishida, who was a colleague um, of the authors of a book called Made in Tokyo. I highly recommend. Uh, it's it's a collection of it's in a way an informal guide or a guide to the informal architecture of a city. Uh, and through that uh, collection, it's a very good way to analyze the identity of the place. Next, please. Um, through a, a series of workshops, we visited a couple of other cities just to try to compare, to put Jeddah in a, in a scale, let's say, of, of density. This was a, a study of Cairo. Uh, we realized the denser and the more layers of history a place has the more informal uh, architecture, it will, uh, it will, uh, because they're interchanged between and intersections between the, all these layers. Next, please. Uh, we were hosted also in Doha for the uh, Tasman Doha, also to give a workshop for some of the students. Now it's much, it was much trickier to do the same workshop in Doha uh, because a lot of the areas were something like this, very uh, uh, mo monotone, uh, cloned, like what I call clone buildings. So there was no layers of history or other aspects to play with. Next, please. Um, we also engaged with some of the universities in, in Jeddah. Dar Hikmah is a school of architecture. We did a three-day workshop called Folly for Jeddah, which is just architecture, just to express um, an, a form of identity of the place. Next, please. Uh, and uh, on one occasion, we uh, were lucky to collaborate with uh, OMA slash AMO. Uh, they were working with uh, Abu Dhabi Urban Planning Council for a publication called Al Manakh Continued. I highly recommend. I think uh, there's a lot of research on Bahrain, um, on Doha, and all the Gulf cities, and uh, it's a good read. 
in terms of data, but also uh, documenting the uh, urban history of those places. Um, Todd Rice was the uh, editor. Uh, we have a few links on our blog called Made in Jeddah. Uh, and one of them, uh, there's a video where Todd explains, uh, uh, gives an overview of the uh, publication experience. Uh, now, why mapping? Uh, your conventional map really doesn't tell you anything about an identity of a place, so you really just have to go there and devise your own techniques that are suitable for a place to uh, delineate, let's say, uh, an identity. Now, this really is excellent when you start the, your design process. It's a source of inspiration, but it's also uh, a factor where you can uh, convince people the need uh, of integrating these aspects, whatever cultural um, aspects you find. What we call uh, hybrid urban uh, occurrences. So these are things that are unintended or unplanned. However, they have a strong indication of they would only happen in such a context, in Jeddah or whatever the context is. Next, please. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll show examples of made in Jeddah. Next, please. Um, oh, sorry, these are some of the. Um, researches we've uh, inspired from, learning from Las Vegas is a good study, Next, please. Uh, made in Tokyo, as I said, an excellent book uh, by Tsukamoto Sensei, next please. And uh, Informa City was the name given to Caracas in Venezuela, which in a way shares a lot with the Gulf, uh, an oil-based economy, Venezuela of course, but a lot of problems with urbanization and, and density, hyper-density, next please. Um, and um, our workshops are not just for students, all of our staff engage in these workshops. Maybe once every two or three months we go out to the city and try to uh, document um, parts of the cities where we think there are some interesting f examples to find. Next please. Uh, we realize the, uh, these are now, we're trying to now analyze and break them down and uh, maybe develop a uh, hypothesis on why or what how you can actually describe these, uh, some of these uh, elements or attributes uh, con uh, or contrast with each other, something that, um, either something imported or something grassroots or, and so forth. Next please. Uh, one of the strongest examples we found that uh, maybe exemplifies uh, what we're trying to look for, um, byproducts of infrastructure, However, different in, in each by the, by the context. Uh, this is an elevated uh, railway, uh, uh, causeway for uh, trains in Tokyo. Now, beyond being ex extremely expensive in Tokyo, the space below it becomes a full fledged uh, department store uh, because of the scarcity of land. Next, please. However, in a metropolis like Cairo, where uh, religion is still uh, uh, um, an influential factor, rather than convert this into a shop, it is a mosque, a full-fledged mosque with the Jummah prayers and, and ablution and so forth. Next please. However, in a place like Jeddah where land is still in abundance, there is no scarcity and um, uh, land value is still at a moderate level, uh, it became more a reflection of need, uh, it's a parking a parking lot. Next, please. Um, some of these, I'll show you a few examples of these urban occurrences that would only happen in a uh, context of Jeddah, given all the players, uh, socioeconomic, historic, and uh, cultural. Um, Fall is a very popular uh, uh, dish, let's call it, in, in the Middle East. However, in uh, the Hijazi culture, where a lot of pilgrims uh, used to come and actually settle. Uh, Tamis is a, a kind of Afghan bread that uh, in Jeddah you could not imagine eating food without. So now they've become this pair, uh, but they've never merged. There's always a, a Tamis bakery separate, but you can guarantee there's a food place next to it. Next place. Uh, these are uh, occurrences based on. Um, 
initiatives uh, by the municipality. Unfortunately, they went wrong. Uh, they in introduced the villa above the uh, uh, apartment block, and um, they had very stringent. You couldn't rent it; you had to use it as the owner. And so you have this interesting duality of uh, architecture and no relation because. The bottom part is for rent, but the upper part is for personal use. So, how you express the materiality? The first next, please. Uh, one of the strongest examples we call the Pizza Mosque. Only in Jeddah, uh, very international cuisine as a pizza uh, in the same building as a mosque. Uh, a reflection of uh, a very unique identity uh, of Jeddahis, very contemporary, but while still in the proximity into Mecca keeps a level, let's say, of uh, uh, religion in the conscious, but however very uh, open because of a port being a port city to have this uh, pizza next to a mosque. Next please. Um, I'll end uh, with what we felt uh, after the burning and with all uh, these problems taking place, we felt um, a lot of cities try to express either grandeur or power or uh, you know places like New York, places like even Istanbul. Uh, it seemed to us that Jeddah was just not interested to communicate anything, and we we felt that's a pity. And that and through this analysis, it's our uh, attempt to try to bring back the dialogue and maybe uh, bring back to the conscious of anyone living and practicing in Jeddah. And what's important. Uh, I, next, please. Uh, we realize some aspects that are uh, shared with the Khaliji city, the oil boom, of course, and the resultant um, effects of that. Uh, for example, uh, there is no tax, uh, a lot of uh, international foreign consultants. In places like Cairo or Turkey, for example, the Turks are building their city, or the Egyptians are building their city. In our case, no, it wasn't the Jidda was building the city. Although in the old days it was. And, and Dubai, of course, Kuwait, the same thing. Uh, an infrastructure that even is even expanding more rapid than the, the population, and still a low population, lack of participation, whatever happened, no one really is, is asked what's going on. Um, unfortunately, car-centric planning and, uh, and the, the speed. Next, please. Well, we also realize that there are each of the cities in the Gulf have something special and highlighting those special things uh, uh, is part of that uh, initiative. So, uh, as I said, Jeddah is in a Khaliji country, but it's not technically or geographically on the Khalij. So, what are these aspects? Next, please. Um, of course, being the gateway to Mecca. Next, please. Uh, we realized um, uh, it support Hajj and Umrah effect. Uh, there's always a uh, multi-ethnicity indigenous, not, not something uh, re uh, recent. Um, and assimilation was much easier uh, pre-oil boom uh, era. Next, please. Um, which also now um, inspired us to uh, take a step back and see what uh, aspects that relate to Hajj and Umrah can we also uh, read into. Uh, we're now embarking uh, next please, on uh, documenting uh, urbanism of the Hajj uh, in Mecca and also in Medina. Uh, through, there's a lot of archives, so that in, in that sense at least there was a lot done by the Hajj Research Center. I'm just showing to end with some of this. Uh, in, so 40 years ago you can actually drive with your own car in front of your uh, Hajj tent. That was the vision put by the planners that, you know, these rich Saudis want to, you know, drive to her. But unfortunately, when you, that's okay when you're dealing with 300,000 uh, Hajis or programs. Uh, already by 75, we reached the 2 million mark in five days, those who haven't been done, done Hajj. 2 million people moving the same movement in five days at once in a very narrow place called Muna and Arafa, of course. Uh, I'm sure you've seen images of the congestion. Next, please. Uh, however, attempts by the Hajj Research Center 40 years ago, it was established in 74 by 
the architect Sami Angawi and uh, his German colleague Bodo Rush. Uh, both worked with Fry Auto on competition uh, for the to try to leave this congestion. Uh, these are some examples of uh, their experimentations, which we think w also was inspiring to us because uh, it was a multidisciplinary center, research center, and while we're bringing this up, I think every city should have uh, a form of research and archiving uh, center to uh, not... Now, the initially, they w their mandate was to solve problems, but they realized in order to solve problems, they needed to document, and they spent the first eight or nine or ten years just documenting data, documenting information and uh, delivering these at international symposiums and conferences. Next please. So sorry, um, if you can go back. This was an attempt to, rather than building concrete, um, introduced a two-level tent, thereby increasing the density of MENA just for five days uh, in a temporary way, but at the same time uh, protecting uh, this geography of this sacred place. Next, please. Uh, another attempt uh, later in 1984 by a local architect, Yusuf Hijazi, uh, with a German company, Gotze, these foldable uh, structures, beautiful. Now, this, in, rather than having twice, they actually increased it maybe three and a half times. There are four levels, but of course, they, they recess, and some of them can actually be leaned against. Uh, if you've been to Muna, the very, very rugged mountain, so and the uh, flat area uh, available does not cannot carry two million, and and of course increasing next speed. Uh, they actually did a few prototypes. They used in the house three or four years. Unfortunately, I think for economic reasons, it did not actually be implemented. But this was the whole idea. Next please, I'll show you the whole in a in a context. You can see uh, back there over there how this scale. The whole idea was it being temporary and protecting the landscape. Next, please. Uh, unfortunately, now we have a, a, a scarred landscape in the Hajj, uh, bits and pieces, a lot of asphalt, which unfortunately really just ruins the whole um, um, ritual of the Hajj and the spirituality. And this is the new uh, train in, in concept an excellent idea but in application very hard because the amount and the sheer volume of people entering and leaving at once uh, they're not able to cope people usually f uh, a distance of 12 kilometers which you can walk in an hour at your, uh, two hours in a very normal pace um, people have been stuck for six to seven hours at inside the train because um, the people leaving the other station could not um, uh, still were leaving, it would take, take them that time. Um, next please. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you Architect Rida. Um, I think we'll move on to Fatma now. Is she ready? Fatma, we're ready for you. Uh -huh. Yeah. So her screen is frozen. Le let me...
Okay. Hello? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Fatma Sahnawi. I'm so sorry for uh, not being able to physically be there um, in Japan with Moana and everyone else. But thank you, Moana, for um, I mean, inviting me to be part of this and participate through this panel and also through uh, the small sort of contribution we've made to the exhibition through uh, a collection of the Adam and Benat magazine. Um, we very much appreciate what, what Moana is trying to do in Bahrain and I think it's very important for us all to come together in this panel where we're all although in different mediums and ways, but we're all trying to sort of put our efforts to um, document, archive, and, and expose um, information that um, has not been uh, readily available to people. Um, I'm going to, I've, I've condensed my presentation uh, just be, in case um, Time does not allow, and the technical sort of issues don't allow. But I'll so I'll try to share my screen now, if that's okay. Okay. Is it? Is it okay on your side? Okay. So I'm just going to briefly talk about um, what I do here in Doha. So I practice as an architect and as an urbanist on different projects. Uh, most of them are state-led projects, be it with Qatar Tourism Authority or Qatar Museums. Um, in parallel, I start back in 2015, October of 2015, I started off um, the project of the Atlas Bookstore. Um, so the, the main mandate that I had for the bookstore was that, um, again, it's a lot of information that I came across, be it in archives and libraries, institutions, during my studies, so on and so forth, but it was always a struggle to reach this information and to get my hands on this information, right? So this project was al had almost the mandate of creating an accessible reference point here in Doha, both for practicing architects, students, the architecture and design community, but also visitors, um, tourists wanting to know more about the built environment of the region, uh, and so on and so forth. So the Atlas Bookstore is um, a, a lending library, but also a bookstore that sells um, books and magazines, publications that reference the architecture and urbanism of the Middle East and North Africa. So we've sort of drawn our territory around this geographic region, right? But, um, and that is in terms of the books that we supply and that we source. However, the research that I've started um, sort of delving into through my studies after graduation until today is more focused on the Gulf region and then more, even more focused on Doha and Qatar. So through the bookstore, there are sort of four different um, ways that we operate, right? There's the project space that we inhabit here in Doha, which is at the Sheraton Hotel. Um, there's a reason why we're here, which I'll talk about in, in shortly. Uh, there are the satellite bookstores. These are the contributions that we make to events that we're invited to, um, to um, in, in, different, in different cities in the region. Um, there's the archive. Uh, which is sort of the parallel activity of the bookstore where we try to, through our visits of the different archives, international archives and regional archives, sort of bring back whatever material we can, we can get our hands on and, and allow people here in Doha and also in the region visiting Doha and visiting the bookstore to access. Um, documentation is another thing that we do. Uh, not only do we sort of try to get our hands on existing material, but through interviews or through uh, research, we try to sort of create new content and create content that, that mainly documents the existing uh, and the ongoing sort of development of the cities and the region. 
And so if I start talking more about our book collections, we try to focus not only on the, the I mean, the hundreds of titles in English, but we try to really look for more and more titles in Arabic because of the scarcity of, of such content. Our beautiful publications that have been published by different authors in different places in the region that are either out of print, rare books, or I mean, or they're not. I mean, they're not easily available and um, easily accessible. So we really try to look into that sort of genre of books. Um, we try to not only focus on books, but also on magazines, be they again old out of print magazines or recent magazines such as Wetted Magazine, for example, and Brown Book that do document um, the built. Um, the built sort of environment and fabric of, of the of the region. Um, and like I said, the, the our, our general books in English cover cover the, the region in terms of the um, architecture and urbanism of the Middle East and North Africa. When the books are I mean when we can when the books are still being printed and published, they are usually for sale. But the books that are out of print or rare books we try to then work on a lending system with um, with the customers that we become familiar with, and it's a it's a beautiful system. I think th that we almost operate as the library because these readers and researchers keep coming back, and we start to develop these really interesting relationships with them and get familiar with the work that they're doing. Sometimes collaborate, sometimes collaborate, and sometimes even um, they would then add to the research that we're doing. So this is the space that we currently occupy, the space I'm in right now. I think it's, it's a shame that I'm not physically there, but it's also nice that I'm actually talking to you from, from the, the space itself of the Atlas Bookstore. And we, as I said, we're currently located at the Doha Sheraton Hotel. This is not how it looks like now. If I know many of you have been to Doha and you know exactly where the Sheraton is and how much this area of West Bay and Doha has developed and has transformed. And so uh, the reason why we're here was because we, in, coincidentally, we were in a conversation with the um, owners of the of the Sheraton Hotel, formerly known as the Qatar National Hotels, now Qatar Hospitality, and they were actually looking for a team of researchers to document um, the hotel building um, and create some content around it, possibly a publication, possibly a film, both that we are currently working on. So it was interesting to sort of base our activities at the Atlas Bookstore here, but then also work out of the Sheraton itself to research, document, and create this content that will soon be published about the building. Um, the second sort of um, uh, sort of activity that we do is, is the satellite bookstores or satellite reading spaces, right? And they're usually responsive to um, invitations that we get. For example, this one was at Al Shahid Park in Kuwait uh, last year, and was it last year? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was again, it was an invitation from a Shahid Park, the Diwan Amiri in Loyak, and Diwan Amiri in Kuwait, and also Brown Book Magazine, who created this event around uh, the modern golden era in Kuwait. And we responded by um, creating this collection of books or curating this collection of books that was mainly focused on this sort of uh, golden era between 1960 and 1980 in Kuwait. And we tried to fetch all the different publications, books that reference that, that sort of theme. But also, uh, further to that, we looked at what existing content um, we could find in terms of PhD. Uh, uh, thesis, thesis, dissertations, articles, so beyond just books and magazines, but any sort of um, any sort of literature that we can find out there. It was not a bookstore in this case, it was more of an exhibition of the content around 50 different publications, and it was really interesting to, to see the whole collection come together and to then meet people from Kuwait who are familiar with some and not others, and sort of, it, it generated this really, really interesting ongoing conversation for, around, for a few days around the content uh, of this of this satellite reading space. And this is another recent one which took place in Dubai during um, 
Design Days Dubai. Again, it was an invitation to create a small sort of breathing space, contrary to all the exhibits around, the design exhibits around. And uh, our collection there was more focused on Dubai, the UAE, but we also had other sort of rare prints uh, referencing the, the region. And um, in, in this case, it was a very interesting setting. It was our first time to, I mean, we, we did Kuwait, but we also do a lot of satellite reading spaces here in Doha, in architecture lectures, at design uh, uh, colleges, and so on and so forth. But this was a new sort of um, setup for us in a, in a design fair. And so the, the footfall was very different. We didn't only get architects and urbanists, but it, this conversation started with designers, with artists, and that was really interesting. And what we also did in this uh, satellite um, space was that we collaborated with um, friends of ours in Bahrain. Uh, I don't know if any of them are there right now. Bahraini, Danish, Maytham, Batul, and Christian. And they actually uh, designed the stools for us. Um, so it, 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 this is the first attempt for us to uh, start collaborating with others and designing the, the space as well. Um, and then we, and then I'll move to archiving. And through archiving, um, I mean, ar we we attempted to archive different projects uh, that have not been published in books and magazines. Projects by Arab architects or other architects, but um, located in in the region, the Middle East and North Africa. So we've attempted to visit many many archives. I have, I think, a few examples of them here, or maybe I just left one. Uh, but this one was the Jafar Tokan Library in Amman, Jordan. Of course, Jafar Tokan was based in Jordan, but he did work on many projects in uh, in the Middle East, but also in the Gulf, in Dubai especially. And it was it was great to visit the archive. Not only to I mean, we I intended to only find and look at and go through. Jafar Tokan's work. But then, what I was surprised to find at the library was that the library was a bigger version, older version, decades old, of what I'm trying to do at the Atlas Bookstore. It's both an archive and a library, and it focuses on books about the Middle East and North Africa because it's it's the personal uh, library of Jafar Tokan and his architecture team. So many references that they looked at are today in this library. And it was, it was both interesting to so learn about Jafar Tokan and his work, but then also get access and go through all of these different publications that then I came back and sort of tried to source from different places. And I came across many of these sort of proposals, some realized, some unrealized, but again, all of these are starting to go into our archive so that they're not only available um, in, in sort of the context of Jafar Tokan's work and Jafar Tokan's library, but they're available, they start to become available in the context of a um, wider sort of array of publications and materials about, uh, about the region, about the, the architecture of the region. And I mean, this was mind blowing. I, I, I always try to sort of not bias my research in terms of just looking at Doha and and, and, or other places in Qatar, but I try to look at the Gulf in the Middle East, Middle East and North Africa, but it always, of course, goes my mind to find new things about Doha, especially that, I mean, just like Rada said, we don't yet have a center of research or an archival center, a centralized archival center where all of this material is available. So it's almost like finding bits and pieces every now and then in different places um, that become very surprising but very sort of pleasant finds. Okay, so this is another one, another uh, place we attempted to visit, again, to find specific, re I went in trying to find very specific content, but then came across a variety of things about different places in the region. This is at the Cité de, de l'Architecture, um, et du Patrimoine in Paris, and I went in to find the George Candelis archives here, and I did, but then I found many other the, the works of many other architects, which was which was a great find, and not only did we find sort of a general broad information about things that the different French architects did in the region, but very detailed drawings that we were then able to scan and bring back with us. And 
mean, this was a beautiful find, the Kapol development plan in 1974 by Ludin Davis, um, British planners that put together the first master plan for Qatar. And this document is a very rare document. Of course, it's by the British firm in a French archive because the French architects then used it as a reference. So it's almost like by visiting these places, these different archives, in, in hopes to build an archive here back home, we come across these different hints of what to look at, where to look at, and like the next archive we then looked at was the Lillian Davis one. And um, again, speaking about hints, this is another hint that we got. We found all of these sort of um, telex um, um, communications, and um, this one was between George Kandilis and Hisham Qadumi, who was the, who was the the chief planner of Doha, uh, end of in, in the late 70s, 80s, early 90s, and it's it we found hundreds and hundreds of these, right? And just by looking, at, just by reading through them, we were able to tell what sort of things happened, what sort of things they were looking at, uh, the sort of dilemmas they had in terms of site selections, uh, the dilemmas they had in in, in terms of. Uh, what architects to bring in as well, and what, how they selected the different architects that then developed the different projects here. Uh, and in terms of documentation, creating sort of creating original and new content rather than archiving, um, that I mean we're, we're we're doing that through different mediums in different ways, right? But one way is to sort of sit with whoever we can sit with, meet them, spend some time with them, sometimes days, sometimes just an hour, just to sort of um, get a first-hand conversation of, of the different works of different architects, different sort of works of planners, different works of clients, and to sort of transcribe these, this is something that I'm working on right now, transcribe these interviews to then make them available, but also trying to I mean, this starts with a lot of research, right? What existing content is there? For example, here with Rafael Chajirji, what existing content is there already uh, about Rafael Chajirji and about Rafael Chajirji's work? Going there, talking about the existing content, but then finding a niche that has not been um, sort of uh, researched or asked or, or conversed with Rafael Chajirji, documenting that, transcribing that, and then making that. So almost participating in this overall um, attempt of, of uh, talking to such architects and bringing back, um, bringing back here to Doha material that we can then publish and make available. Another one was a beautiful, beautiful afternoon spent with Abdurrahman Mahmoud in Abu Dhabi. So he was the chief planner of Abu Dhabi and he just, at, nine, at 90 years old, he's still at his office every day working on a new book. Not, I mean, it's not, it's not a small book. It's, it's very rich in content. Um, and what was beautiful about this conversation was that it didn't only stop at his work and his experiences, but he then sort of took us through his library, and that brought us to a beautiful find, this book *Rujul al Medina* by Sabah George Sugar, who um, had, who had multiple. Um, who had multiple books about uh, Kuwait and the Arab cities. And then, so that then led us to look, to try and source more and more books about Sabah George and Book for Atlas. So th these are the different ways and attempts in which, in which I'm trying to sort of set up this, um, set up this piece which acts as a, as a reference, local reference here, but regional reference and I mean, we're working right now on putting most of the material up on the website. It's 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 tricky. It's challenging to. I mean, we, we've reached over 600 titles right now. So how to put the different materials on the website? The rare books. How can we make them readily available um, digitally? So it's these are the different attempts, and it's an ongoing project, hoping to, like I said, not only benefit people here locally but also regionally. And, yep, I think that's it for me. Thank you, Fatma, for a very informative presentation. So we'll move to our next speaker for today. He's also joining us through uh, Skype. 
Our next speaker is uh, Ali Karimi. Uh, he's a Bahraini graduate of the Harvard School of Design, where the um, where he received a master's degree in architecture. Ali has worked in Brussels as well with the office KGDVS and in New York with SOIL and uh, in Chile as well with Elemental. In addition to his time abroad, um, time abroad, he also attained. Um, regional experience and public projects through his time in Bahrain with Gulf House Engineering. So Ali's interests are in the local uh, social housing projects, uh, public space and uh, infrastructural reimaginations of the Gulf countries. He was recently co-curator co of the Kuwait Pavilion titled Between East and West uh, Gulf at the two 2016 Venice Biennale with Hamad uh, Bukhamsin. He has also conducted research on government built housing uh, in GCC with Affordable Housing Institute uh, in Boston uh, as a joint center for housing studies fellow. Uh, and uh, in Havana with the grant from David uh, Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, his work has been published in San Rocco, CLOG, Wallpaper Magazine, and other media outlets. So I'll leave it to uh, Ali now. Or no? Ah, okay, I can hear myself. Um, so I want to work with the slides. Is there, are the slides on another screen, or will the slides come up on that screen and I can see myself? Ah, okay, cool. Uh, first of all, uh, April Fools, if you're expecting Ali Baba, you get Ali Karim. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you all for being there, and I'm sorry I can't be, uh, can't be with you. I'm, I'm currently in Brussels. I'll be in Bahrain uh, next week. So if anyone has any questions or wants to get coffee or something, uh, I'll be back in a week's time. Um, so anyway, thank you all for being there, for making the time. Thank you to Saha, Moani, and the other presenters. Uh, I, I managed to catch uh, the, the two uh, poor mine, and it, it was great to catch them. I'm sorry I missed Ahmed's. Um, so it's, I'd like to just begin by saying it's really exciting to be part of such a great panel, and also colleagues that I respect and uh, great. Well, respect and anticipation. And I think in this context of a kind of historical arc, it's very important And so, I guess I begin first by, by I, I guess, saying that the slides that I'll be presenting are a question of sorts. And the title of this presentation is Learning to Forget. Sorry. If it's too much, I can just do my uh, microphone. If it's if it's maybe better quality. What did he say? I do reconnecting. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if, 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 if it starts stuttering, I can also turn off my video. Um, but maybe, actually, yeah, let's, maybe let's do that. Let's full screen the slides and I'll turn off the video just so it, it becomes uh, clearer. Or would I still pop up if you full screen the slides? Yeah, I guess that's good. Um, so, in, in Reflections on Exile, Edward Said talks about the, let's say, the Palestinian condition and the larger state of exile in the 20th century as being maybe the, the kind of absolute um, state of modernity. In this sense, or in the sense that um, the existence of a Palestinian in, in New York, specifically himself, he gravitates between either that of complete nostalgia being nostalgia for a state that they can't inhabit or a place that they come from that they can't return. 
of communities uh, where you participate where you participate in this is so you just can't be so in the So you exist to say complete for Um and so in, in kind of use this society essentially talks about how we perceive the law. Uh, do we do so in a state of pure self or a state of pure forgetfulness? Um and so I'm gonna bring it back to our discussion today. Any discussion on the archival path and our position I'll turn off video, my mind. Okay, let, let's try maybe... Uh, I guess I have to... Um, yeah. If I can turn on... I'll turn off the video, but you turn on your video. Just so I can see. No, but for some reason, your I think your video isn't on. Maybe. Okay. Uh, yeah, but can you turn on your video and I'll turn off mine? Okay, great. Um, so, uh, well, perfect. So anyway, um, I, I, so in our position in kind of this larger history, uh, our work, and I think I speak for maybe all of all of the panelists, looks to the past for something, but it's all also constantly in realization that the moment we inhabit is already in the past. Meaning someone in, in 30 years might find this lecture and say, ah, oh, these are the guys that ruined Bahrain and Doha and Kuwait and Jeddah. So I think with that in mind, uh, maybe I will suggest or we'll ask whether it's better to uh, learn to remember or maybe if it's sometimes more useful to learn to forget. Or to put it in a larger context, to ask how we learn to forget and why we forget. Uh, so next slide, please. So today I'll present three examples or three kind of exercises. The first, being the lead-up to the Kuwait Pavilion, the second, uh, research on housing in Bahrain, and third is a kind of, is an article or um, an issue of a publication we're working on, looking at previous architects. And in doing so, I think we see our, kind of the method of our um, operating as a practice laid completely bare by saying how we kind of think through problems, but also how in, in doing so, any practice which looks to history looks to forget as much as it chooses to remember. And I won't go into detail with each project because it's made, uh, there's no time and because also a lot of these projects have been explained uh, elsewhere. Uh, next slide, please. So kind of, uh, go, uh, going back to the previous lectures talking about um, El Manaf, 10 years ago, uh, or we've, we've hit the 10-year anniversary of uh, OMA AMO's uh, Gulf. And 10 years ago was maybe the point also, uh, the, the Gulf presented the Gulf right before the economic and political landscape of the Middle East changed completely. And so the, the Gulf that AMO presented is perhaps a Gulf that is completely unfamiliar to us now. And it seems increasingly a vision of a previous generation looking to create perhaps new markets for their architecture, a utopic vision in which um, Rem, uh, Rem and Todd Rees and all may uh, imagined a, a kind of a second modernist condition, in an, but in a new neoliberal setting, completely commercial and divorced from criticality, enough to not be unpalatable to um, to architects. It described the Gulf, uh, and and these uh, the words the quotes were a new tabula rasa of shimmering landscapes, uh, shimmering skyscrapers, Bedouins and Porsches, and an oil-funded urbanism. Next slide, please. Yet, uh, and, and perhaps suspiciously so, we've heard these stories now in the Gulf of East for over 70 years. Our grandparents grew up in a world where, uh, where everything was supposedly new and where the Tabula Rasa was finally being built. Uh, and so, depending on who you listen to, Tabula Rasa has existed in the Gulf since the late 1800s. Uh, in fact, if you choose to read the Life magazine article in 1952, 
it describes the state of finally the Middle East coming to the first world uh, with, with quotes, farewell to flies, almost seeming like suddenly you turn the page and it would say hello to Dubai or hello to highways. And so, curiously enough, the Gulf has been reinventing Square once since the 1920s when a young British officer named Charles Belgrave came to Bahrain. Uh, next slide. And, and and by my estimation, at least, uh, I'd say Belgrave is it is maybe well. I put him in the top three, but he's among the most important figures in Bahrain's 20th century, or at least maybe among the most interesting. Uh, so the, the piece mentioned earlier, published in San Rocco in 2014. Imagine if what if we continued Mubakarat Belgrave, uh, the kind of infamous journals banned in Bahrain, which described the 30-year period that he administrated the country and his experiences in, in Bahrain's early development and asked what if Belgrave had invented a master plan for Bahrain uh, which was implemented right after he left in 1957 and continued to this day. So in kind of a delirious New York uh, um, model, what if we understood the ecology of an island country through the lens of uh, the management of an advisor or the last 50 years of Bahrain, if someone had sat down slide. Uh, and one particular anecdote of Belgrave's time would return when Hamid and I began to work on the, the exhibition which preceded, preceded the Kuwait Pavilion. Um, so in the early 20th century, the island of Jeddah, off the coast of Bahrain, between Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, north of Oman Nahtan, uh, the island of Jeddah, which was a limestone quarry for a, po a point in time, used to build Barbar Temple and all that, uh, became a prison and a place of exile. Uh, so Charles Valgrave relates in his uh, diary that Jeddah Island would um, would be turned to a prison for kind of people that wouldn't be left on the mainland of Bahrain. Uh, but he, over time, kind of fell in love with this island. So he would start going fishing, and then him and the prisoners began to build a vacation home on the island. So what was formerly a quarry became a prison, and then a summer home for the administrator. And in the 1950s, Jeddah would become a uh, prison for three members of the National Union Committee, one of the early Bahraini political activist groups. Um, and three of its members um, would be exiled to the island and then to St. Helena. Uh, St. Helena being the same place Napoleon was exiled to. Um, and then they, their, their Bahraini citizenships were taken away. They were given St. Helenese citizenships. And they spent a few years there before eventually leaving and going to either Lebanon, the UK, and elsewhere. And, I mean, for us, this was fascinating because uh, Jeddah now is a, has been closed off. The prison has moved to elsewhere in Bahrain. But for a brief moment in time, yes. Okay, what was the last thing you guys heard? Hello? What was the last thing you guys heard? Wait, after what? Oh, the oh, oh, man, that was like two minutes ago. Shit, okay. Um, man, I, I'll, I'll try to get through this quicker. That way maybe we uh, we cover more ground. Uh, turn on the video again, please. Sorry. Uh, basically, Jitter was turned to a prison and a place of exile. Belgrave took it over. The, the, pr uh, the prison was eventually closed, but the people... Wait, did you get the whole, like, uh, the, the guys that moved to St. Helena, or was that cut off? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, great. Anyway, um, so... You should be on slide seven. Okay, the video is turning back on. Okay, yeah, that slide. So anyway, um, for 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 us, for me, Hamid and I, this revealed a different way of thinking about islands uh, as places of exile, places of exclusion, but really as as, as um, a territory for problem solving. Uh, if if we forget all the kind of the, the the histories of these islands, if we forget Jeddah for a moment. You would believe that ah, the Jeddah was a place that was created to solve problems, either the solve the problem of where a British administrator would go fish, or where political activists would be sent. 
And so we began to ask, uh, and through a series of studies and, and writings elsewhere on Mecca, on um, well, on St. Helena, on Musandam Peninsula, we began asking what other islands could be imagined as, as, as places of solving problems. And so you see here the models for um, an exhibition called Arabistan. And Arabistan was essentially an archipelago created in the Gulf to solve different problems in the region. So what if you had an example, for example, an island for refugees, an island for immigrants, an island where women could drive in Saudi Arabia? What if you solved all the Gulf's problems through islands? And obviously this wasn't uh, so much about actually solving problems, but using these territories as a way of articulating the landscape of the Gulf, of describing its territories in a different way, and of really using its histories as a way to justify a, a, a new project. So saying, in fact, history, not only are these ways, not only do these problems exist, but they've been being solved through islands for the last 50 years. Next slide, please. So one proposal, for example, was a museum on St. Helena uh, to national movements in the Gulf, or national movements the world over, but which also could double as a prison. Uh, next slide. And this is the entrance to the exhibition, which was held in Boston. Next slide. And there was kind of these postcards and tote bags. So there was the idea of a kind of one-to-one -one relationship. And in fact, we advertised, uh, this was completely kind of a farce uh, on our point. We advertised this as a preview of the Arabistan Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. And so people were, were came to this thing and they said, ah, this is going to be the Biennale. And we said, no, this is a year before the Great Pavilion. And we said, no, this is just the proposal of what what would it be if the Gulf countries banded together and proposed a series of islands. Uh, and so it was this kind of consultant's pitch. But later on, eventually we asked, well, we, we proposed it. We said, what if this actually was, uh, was a proposal for a Quake Pavilion? Uh, next slide. So we, put, we pitched it to Anne Charles, but when we did so, we said, uh, we didn't say, hey, what if we need to research off the islands of the Gulf? But actually, we said, uh, listen, Kuwait has had a part one and a part two, and what if there was a third episode to the National Pavilion? Meaning, what if you imagine that the first two pavilions were part of a national trilogy for Kuwait? So, So be beginning from Ketra to uh, next slide to acquiring modernity we said, actually, what if we began with the, ma the question of master planning and the kind of the museum as an embodiment of this national exercise in Kuwait? And what if the third one became a, a projective platform where you took the sorts of lessons from these two, but also some of the material and um, spatial qualities of the first pavilions and instead reimagined them as, uh, as the beginnings of a master plan for the Gulf at large? So the first pavilion, the second pavilion are actually build ups to a third pavilion. Which, which, which read the, the Gulf through Kuwait and Kuwait through the Gulf. Next slide. And so the Kuwait Pavilion um, at the past uh, Venice Biennale in 2016, the premise was what if there was a single uh, piecemeal master plan for the Gulf? And what if we kind of forgot for a moment the, the grievances between the Gulf countries and, and, and remembered the islands not as a space for contestation, but at, as a territory for imagining new uh, economic, political, and social configurations. Uh, a shared project and spaces for a shared um, discourse on the territory and its future. Uh, next slide, please. So we invited different architects, writers, um, and, and contributors to, to give us pieces, either of design proposals for a different gulf, or uh, pieces of a history where actually the history was shared. Uh, for example, Fatma presented um, a beautiful piece on Banana Island in Gipar, in Doha, and it talked about how the exercise of dredging, as this kind of uh, exercise for creating the waterfront of, of Doha, would begin to create these islands, and then you had the islands which became something unto their own. 
And uh, without going too much into it, the, the book can be found online. Uh, next slide. But we looked at these 300 islands of the Gulf as this forgotten landscape. Uh, but imagine them as, as the waters of space of forgotten history. And it was really a structure in the history of the region. So this here was a way of understanding what the condition of having demonic loss. And this is important because we came, we came at it not In this case, we say that there isn't something that was lost, but that nothing was actually lost, that these islands have existed the whole time, we found different ways to use them, and so history here doesn't become a way of, uh, of constructing a condition and then saying, oh, this is a condition which we lost, but in fact, here's a condition which is ongoing and um, continuously developed. Next slide. Uh, which was de depicted in the Kuwait Pavilion book. Next slide. And in the space of the pavilion. This is a photo by Rani Ghassan with her uh, husband and son. Um, I guess in, in the interest of time, I should probably cut it short because, because I don't want it to interrupt. But let me just quickly... I don't actually have any other ones open. Um, but let, let's, I guess, just end the... Or, uh, Let's go to quickly through the next few slides. Um, so, actually, uh, yeah, let's go through all of these kind of just quickly, and then we can go to the conclusion, just because I don't want to go on too long. But the other two projects, I think, for, for us, reveal kind of in co complement to the Quake Pavilion, what's at stake in the project of history. So uh, now with Bahrain going through the second phase of the beginning of the journey of constructing 40,000 houses, I think we can maybe say that actually the journey hasn't started, but in fact has been ongoing for 50 years. Um, a journey that began actually with Belgrave, Medina al Ammal and Harag, and continues today, where we've uh, where we've actually arrived at 50 years of, of defining and building up Bahrain through the Ministry of Housing. Currently, if you do the math, 30% of Bahrain's built-up area is Ministry of Construction Housing. Uh, pause at that slide. Yeah, that one. Um, and so in this, uh, in this case, learning to forget isn't about retreading uh, old grounds and saying how we understand the history, but it's saying um, how, how have we learned to, um, learn to for, or saying that this journey is actually a, another repetition of uh, 60 years of creating the Gulf citizen and creating the Gulf city. And in fact, if we look at Muharraq, um over the course of uh, the last 100 years, a city where our historic city is maybe 150 years old, if you look at the oldest buildings, then you can look at how the how it becomes a case for understanding how the, re the Ministry of Housing has restructured the urban landscape of Bahrain. Even by drawing one cross section east west, you see 100 years of history and of Ministry of Housing. Um, and in the interest of time, uh, well, uh, if you can go to the next slide. And then the one after that. So we can say, well, we can say actually, Isha Town 60 years ago looks a lot like, next slide, Sitra today. And in fact, we haven't, uh, the forgetfulness that here comes actually the fact that we've been repeating um, political modalities for the past 60 years with very little change in, uh, in the architecture, the urbanism, but really very little change in the ability to discuss what this architecture means uh, in the 21st century. And for the for the kind of last exercise, next slide. Uh, we're not the first, so next slide. Um, and I think Fatma's Fatma kind of covers this ground beautifully. Is uh, we're we're not the first of, of many, and in fact, we come after a generation of Islamic, modernist, Egyptian, Arabic, Khaliji, nationalist, Western, Iraqi architects. I mean, we come after next slide. Makia's proposals for Awali, Makia's Isa Town Gate, um, the Crown Prince Court. So we, we actually come after a generation that's already tried to figure out what we're about, tried to say what an Arabic architect is, an Islamic architect is, and so on. Uh, this is a girl piece representing Bahrain in DC. Next slide, and this is the final slide. 
Um, and so in kind of learning, uh, looking, at, looking at this history, we really realize that we're not the first generation. And I think that's a really humbling prospect. That, um, that we're a generation that exists after people have already figured out what it means to be Arab and nationalist and Khaliji and pan-Arab and pan-Gulf, uh, which is an exciting moment because I think we're able to fully embrace the the kind of the moment we're in and to say, well, actually, now that we've remembered a lot of the things we were worried we lost, we can forget them for good. Or we can choose what to forget and what to remember. Uh, and so this is a kind of uh, I was trying to think of uh, first Okay, uh, I'll try to do the conclusion quickly. I'm, I'm really sorry about this, guys. Um, so, in the third issue for VVV, uh, we'll look at the 20th century and the 21st century through the 20th century. And ultimately, as we kind of close on the idea of what to remember and what to forget, we say that if modernity was the idea that the world can be remade, forgotten and rebuilt, uh, and if we see that uh, Omey's dream of, uh, of a gulf, uh, or specifically just an Arab gulf, was one which reinvented everything we knew, the gulf as a place where civilization and urbanism could be reinvented. We see in Belgrave's vision, an ecological vision for Bahrain without malaria, but also with women's education, with a completely different uh, political landscape. And then we come to the Kuwait Pavilion where we choose to forget uh, the tensions and the current status quo of these islands and remember them as a, maybe a, an alternate history. And I think that's fine. And, and so the voice here becomes one of saying perhaps not everything needs to be, be remembered. And we're in a moment where we've come after enough generations that not everything is worth saving. But all that matters is that we learn to remember just as easily as we learn to forget. And we keep in mind that we still need to learn how to forget. Okay, thank you, uh, Ali. So kind of you joining us from uh, Brussels. So I'll introduce the last uh, speaker for today, and then we'll have the panel discussion. Originally, our speaker was uh, Zahra Ali Baba from Kuwait, but unfortunately, she twisted her leg, she, so she can't make it uh, today. So hope she'll get well soon. But we have another speaker uh, who's coming also from Kuwait, um, Noor Bushahri. Thank you for joining us on a sh such a short notice. So I will be introducing both of the speakers. Um, Zahra Ali Baba um, is an architect, graduated from Kuwait University in 2008, co-curated um, the Winter School Middle East in, two th in 2011, co-founder of Kuwait Chapter of uh, Dukumomo International, and a member of Kuwait delegation to the UNESCO World Heritage Committee since 2011 who initiated and continued to uh, heritage assessment and conservation project of Kuwait and urban architectural legacy. Zahra is involved in curating and commissioning various cultural programs, exhibitions and research projects at Kuwait National Council for Culture and uh, Arts and Letters. Our speaker who is here today, Noor Bushahri, uh, she received a bachelor degree in architecture from Kuwait University and a master's degree in um, design studies focusing on critical con conversation conservation sorry at harvard university graduate school of design her current research interest revolves around the island of felica as a case study uh, for balancing future development and conservation methods so i'll leave the mic to her So I turn on video, please.
Hello everyone, good evening. Thank you so much for being very patient. Um, so as, as I mentioned, yes, this was a very last minute thing for me. I'm sorry to disappoint if you're all expecting Zahra. But um, so basically what I'll, what I'll do here is sort of um, move on after what Ali Karimi was presenting on the Kuwait Pavilion and sort of share with you part of my research or my contribution to that pavilion and really sort of showcase um, a research and a thesis that happened and could not have happened without any archival research or documentation from the GCC countries. So basically my interest and my participation in the Kuwait Pavilion was regarding the island of Felicia in Kuwait. Um, the island has, um, has a vast history and has suffered a lot through um, our relatively recent years um, and is now undergoing one of many uh, master plans and many reconstruction and redevelopment plans being developed for the island, none of which have seen complete um, fruition. So, thank you. All right. So, uh, located just just off the coast of Kuwait is the island of Felaka. The island is home to the archaeological footprints of fragmentary villages spanning over 4,000 years of global history. It's located within the Persian Gulf, allowing its location, sorry, within the Persian Gulf allowed for continuous human settlement dating back to the Bronze Age, related to the Dilmun civilization, which you're familiar with here in Bahrain, uh, along with Alexander the Great settlement related to the Hellenistic period. Here we have the Temple of Artemis. Um, we have early Christian settlements on the island, as well as pre-Islamic and early Islamic era settlements. Eventually, leading up to the Kuwaiti settlement of the island, where we're able to see um, a large history of sort of the development of Kuwaiti architecture, from the traditional um, mud brick and courtyard houses all the way to, to our concrete structures that we all know today. This succession of some of the world's most notable civilizations brought with them their own historical narratives and physical representations, contributing to the collective identity of the island. So today, here's what could be expected upon visiting the island. So upon arrival at one of the two main ports of Felaka, located along the southwest coast of the island, visitors walk up to the dock and are immediately greeted by the impaired sites of current Felaka. So Felaka, as you all know, was um, sort of uh, home to much devastation, especially during the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990, where the island was actually one of the first uh, sort of uh, base camps for Iraqi military. And after everyone, all of the Kuwaitis or all of the residents of the island, Kuwaitis and non-Kuwaitis, were sort of forcefully evacuated off the island, um, the island was sort of a place of much destruction and was also serving as target practice for military as well. So immediately today, you're greeted by images of destruction. And then you have the promise of Felica, sort of. Um, this idea of a Felica heritage village. Felica that celebrates the, the history of Kuwait. And so you have the options of staying at Icarus Hotel and dining at their restaurant. But these are only fragments of a largely unrealized development plan for the island that aims to transform it into a winter resort to attract the growing regional tourism industry to, to Kuwait. A vision shared through several development plans, beginning with Felica's preliminary master plan. On December 29, 1962, Arab urban planner Saba George Shibir published an article that made the case for the development of Felica. In his article, Shibir goes into great detail about Felica becoming an international winter resort. He explains the advantages of transforming the island into not only a place of rest and recreation, but also as a great source of income for the government of Kuwait. In his word, this languid island, a stone's throw away from hustling and bustling Kuwait, is a ready-made asset to Kuwait. If it can be developed and provided necessary amenities to become a resort area, a playground on an international level during the months from November to April when the weather of the Arabian Gulf is ideal and when it is too cold in most other places. 
For this reason, Shibut expressed the need for a master plan of development of the island. Now also keep in mind that this is still um, pre-Iraqi invasion. His excitement and belief in the island's potential gained much popularity. He expressed the view that Felica can be to Kuwait, what the Princess Islands are to Istanbul, what the Greek islands are to Athens, what Capri is to Rome, and what the Canaries are to Spain. The aspects of his proposal in light of present-day knowledge and conservation practices bring to light questions regarding the ability to retain Felica as a peaceful sanctuary for both its local residents at the time and the projected tourists. In other locales where such fi financially driven proposals have been implemented, culture typically takes a backseat to the hustling and bustling Kuwait, the sort of uh, culture. Development often usurps local, local populations while it fulfills the expectation of international tourism, redefining the existing fabric. Ultimately, though, the Iraqi, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990 halted any realistic development, um, development plans as the island now serves as an open war museum, an open wound really, that has yet to heal. With regards to its future development, however, construction versus destruction becomes a key question to be addressed in the case of Felika, with particular reference to the Shrine of Al-Khabr. Part history, part legend, and deeply rooted in religion, the story of Al-Khadr is one that is mentioned in the Holy Quran with global parallels relating him to various other figures, including, but not limited to, St. George of the Dragon, Alexander the Great, the Babylonian goddess of Ishtar, to name a few. Legend has it that during one of his great journeys, Al-Khadr passed through the island of Felika. On the very side of his, passion, uh, of his passage, during this grand voyage, a shrine was built in his memory, and the legend has it is that there is a footprint left by him on that location where the shrine is built. Here you can see the location of the shrine. Legend has it that during, yeah, leaving a footprint, yeah, sorry. On the very side of his passage during this grand voyage, a shrine was built in his memory. Slowly it became a place of gathering for people of the island, and over the years, people from surrounding countries would visit the shrine for spiritual and religious purposes, leaving gifts and performing rituals at the site as the site has become associated with blessings, in particular with relation to health and fertility. Gradually, these acts became a discomfort for those who did not share these beliefs. And as a result of these conflicts and beliefs and functions of the site, the shrine was continuously rebuilt and demolished over the course of a few decades, leading up to the last shrine, de shrine demolition in 1977. Still, the legend lives on. So the conflict over the shrine is emblematic of the issues that need to be confronted um, in the discussion of how best to present Felika. Its treatment in various development plans provides a window into these deep-seated cultural conflicts that are sometimes reflected and at other times ignored in master plans. This first master plan proposed for the island of Felika by Kuwait municipality in 1962 by Sabah George Shubar, as mentioned, clearly intended to eliminate the shrine by repurposing the land uses around the area of the shrine designating it as an amusement zone. Here you can see the location of where the shrine is. Whether from ignorance of the significance of the site or as an attempt to further ensure the erasure of the shrine and its historical but particularly religious significance, this marked the modern perspective on the site. While the intentions behind the plans are open to discussion, the constant destruction and rebuilding of the shrine illustrates the power of storytelling and the politics behind embracing or erasing stories from the identity of a place such as Felica. In this case, a master plan can become a great tool in an attempt at the reconstruction of a religious identity and culture. It is important to be aware of those whose history is being told and for what purpose, while distinguishing between history as fact and heritage as a human construct. As of 2013, specific sites along Felica have been submitted to UNESCO's World Heritage Center's tentative list. Despite pending review, there is no mention of a global significance behind the Shrine of Al Khadr or its story. The possibility. Oh, sorry. Right. The possibility of a designation provides great anticipation in the hopes of preserving Felika's history and heritage. The best places are either a closely controlled corporate environment like Disneyland, constantly being revised as the future arrives or places that attract resident, residents and tourists for a variety of reasons. Or Las Vegas, a hustling and bustling tourist destination that through its imported variety of globally significant destinations, such as replicas of the pyramids of, the pyramids of Egypt or the Eiffel Tower of Paris, keeps tourists and visitors interested as they provide something for everyone. 
Thailaka, as a site for a potential tourism market, includes in its own history a variety of different sites relating to global histories that, if used well, can create a steady global interest in the island without the need to resort to replicas of important histories and constructed heritage. Between the global and the local sites of Felaka, the potential is there for the island to become a site of permeable boundaries, aimed to interest visitors of all religions, ethnicities, and nationalities, aimed to educate visitors on the beauty that lies within the integration of all histories. Where else in this day and age, in this regional political climate, can a visitor experience global histories 4,000 years apart in one location? This is what is unique to Felaka, and this is what needs to be embraced. As Doreen Macy states in her Places and Their Past book, perhaps a really radical history of a place would be one which did not try to present either simple temporal continuity or only spatial simultaneity with no historical depth. A way of understanding which in the end did not try to seal a place up into one neat and tidy envelope of space and time, but which recognized that what has come together in this place now is a conjunction of many histories and many spaces. Here a case can be made for Al Khadr Shrine, a site that for many years had become significant space for people of the of Felaka, making it an integral part of the island's social fabric and for the people of various faiths and beliefs. The fact that the shrine is continuously rebuilt proves its persistent significance, and though its site is currently flattened, a day visitor to the island continues to make the trip to the site where the where the shrine once stood. And here we see an image of people just sort of gathering a few bricks or adding a few, like a flag or green, something in, in memory of this shrine. An act that can be better understood as the poetry of history lies in the, sorry, this quote, which I will not read. Right. So the richness of Felica lies within the inclusion of its layered histories. Let whatever future development take place serve as an added layer rather than a replacement or erasure of a previous one in the service of a constructed narrative. It is unclear what the future holds for Felica's past, but one thing is for certain. A fully implemented master plan becomes a great nationalist tool in an attempt to reconstruct the historical identity and national heritage. It could be a benefit to those in power at a critical point in time. While a plan is necessary to move forward with the implementation of development in an organized manner, it needs to be contextual and malleable, as opposed to grandiose and unyielding. It needs to anticipate and enable evolution with the aim to accommodate a multifaceted and ever-growing context that looks to the future to develop the present without excluding the island's rich history. So basically, this here is an example of sort of what can come out of archival research. For me, this research would not have been possible had it not been for all of the documentation that was available for me. Um, now, of course, I did face many difficulties, especially since this re research was mostly done in my time at, um, in Cambridge at Harvard. So I was mostly able to sort of get what, it, what was available online or through phone calls or having sort of my very generous and gracious foot soldiers in Kuwait sort of go and sort of beg for these documents from various municipalities and government entities. So here, I mean, this is just an example of sort of the beauty that can come out of well-documented and archived histories. And the case of Al-Khadr here serves as an excellent case um, for archiving as well. Um, I would like to sort of um, maybe disagree with one last point that my colleague Ali Karimi mentioned, which is that maybe not everything needs to be um, saved or archived. I would argue Yes, not everything needs to be conserved, but everything definitely needs to be documented. And it is not our place in this current, present time to decide what will or will not be important for future references. So this is just an example of something that can come up, provided we document things well. And I leave you with this sign from the island of Felica that says, the beauty of the island reflects, with an X, your inner beauty. Thank you. Thank you, Noor. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for today's very lovely presentation. So we have uh, Jeddah, Kuwait, and Bahrain, uh, and Qatar. Um, so we still have our speakers on Skype if you want to ask them any questions. So let's just open up the discussion now. Any questions? Okay. In your opinion, uh, what is the role of architectural firms in archiving? 
because uh, I work in an architectural firm and we don't document anything for more than 10 years. But do we have a responsibility? Um, I think, I can take this one here. I think um, where we are today in Bahrain specifically or maybe in other countries in the Gulf because um, government entities and official entities, they don't actually document an archive. We really rely on the archives of the private institutions and thus being architects, engineers um, and sometimes even development companies. I think it's sad that you get rid of your archives every 10 years and I understand that this is a challenge in terms of how to maintain it and archive it and catalog it. But I think with, in this digital era, it would be much easier to build an archive um, for what we built from now moving forward at least, so we don't face the same challenges 50 years from today. Uh, unless it's a military facility, one suggestion would be once the building is finished, maybe at the lobby present the drawings and the model rather than keep it up at the executive office so that the public visiting the building can at least uh, either see the process, the early sketches for example, uh, instead of waiting until you know, someone comes up like Fatima and after 60 years <laughs> puts it up in her library. But uh, I find something we suffer from in Saudi Arabia, I mean, even here project, um, plaquets at least mention the architect, uh, in a lot of cases they don't. So um, it's very important for the public to know what architects do and if a building has been finished, to exhibit it even for a while, the drawings, the perspectives and some of the, the models would be great. Now, I think it's great to have an archive for especially an architecture firm. Um, but I think we also need to sort of um, establish what, what sort of archive or how fast it's going to be and how detailed. So I understand the need to sort of wipe it clean sort of every 10 years, just to make it manageable, let's say. But as an architecture firm, um, I would highly recommend documenting all of your sort of um, all of your projects, and it might not have to be this massive archive. It could just lead to a publication, let's say, every 10 years. So then you have that at least that is sort of fixed and set in time, and then you can move on to your next um, generation of buildings, let's say. Thank you. Um, thanks to all the speakers. It's been fascinating to hear you speak about your work. Um, I'm w I wonder whether you can speak to um, private developments and how that affects how we interact with our histories because um, a number of you, you know, touched on how um, a lot of our modern architecture is private and um, yeah, I mean, I don't know either what the Bahraini architecture can be defined as, but I think gated architecture would feature a lot and I wonder how that affects um, how we archive and how we interact with our history. From a development point of view? Oh, yeah. I think from a development point of view, we were just having a chat, me and uh, Dick Rafay earlier, um, how developers are only incentivized by financial goals. Um, archiving is usually something left to the architects, unless it's a prestigious in a way or, an, or another, or if it's a, of a certain scale, then the developer will actually build an archive for such a project. Um, so we do rely on the architects to actually archive all their projects, not every 10 years. Um, but in terms of developers, developers usually, in, in many instances, they get into the project and they just get out as soon as they sell all the units, as soon as they sort of they have a certain exit strategy and then that project is just another investment. They don't have necessarily all the details. They don't keep them, they pass them to the new owners. And that's another challenge is in who guards these details moving forward. I think that's in a way. Unless archiving becomes an investment. Exactly. Well, that's sort of the issue with privatizing any, any type of endeavor, really. Um, is to serve whose purpose. And that brings me back to even the idea of history and sort of when we're archiving. So here, let's say, with the case I presented of Al-Khadr Shrine, not everyone is 
for remembering this history of the island. Not everyone agrees with this history of the island. And for me, this was an issue that I faced with trying to find documentation, trying to find information about the existence of this shrine. Um, you run into this issue of sort of people are very selective as to what to put into an archive and what to keep out. Um, and often, I mean, there are different agendas, there are different um, points of view, there are different, I mean, be them political, religious, or what have you, economical at the same age as well. So I think sort of even as far as documenting, we need to be, I mean, it's hard, but as unbiased as we possibly can in sort of deciding what is important enough to go in this archive or not. So an example for in Kuwait, something we sort of, um, a cycle that we tend to get ourselves into is um, during sort of our highly developmental sort of period, which is like the 60s and 70s, and this is like right after oil and, and Kuwait as a country and as a nation was really eager to catch up sort of with the rest of the world as far as development goes and as far of sort of bringing in this new modern architecture. So the older architecture was seen as that was seen as old and sort of tired and no no it's okay we can just sort of erase it maybe as we do with our archives every few years <laughs> so and that tell us let's erase it and and make sort of room for something new right now we're going through that again in kuwait where but now it's sort of caught up to our modern architecture and that is now being demolished to make way for new structures and buildings and the best way we can save it for now i mean it's hard to argue if a plot of land is you know like very expensive and as far as development goes, it's hard to argue and you really have to educate the public as to why specific buildings need to stay alive and need to exist. If not physical, then they must be sort of remembered archival and documented well enough. So it's just this idea about moving forward with our histories and just being careful of what to sort of certain people pick and choose. And here at the Gulf, we have this history of sort of being also secretive with our information. and maybe manipulated to some extent based on the image we would like to sort of present. So as far as our archiving goes, this should not happen, you know? Okay. Hmm? Oh, Ali wants to comment? Is he commenting? <laughs> Ali, you can comment. We can hear you. Hello? Ah, okay. You can hear me. Yeah. Um, I would, well, the, the two questions are interesting because they all touch upon a large systemic issue. Uh, I think this is as an example of my own. It's a You're cutting off, uh, Ali. We can't hear you clearly. We'll try to reconnect. Okay, we'll go to the next question while we fix this technology issue. No, I just uh, want first of all thank you for everyone's uh, you know perspective on the issue of archiving and the challenges we're facing. But uh, one thing that struck me as each of you went through your own personal um, experience with it is that um, how do we make archiving valuable? Because obviously it's something that we need to do. It's happening on uh, different levels. But now the question is. Um, you know, when you start to sit down and go through the information, things pop up, things come to each and every one of us. But um, who is responsible for, you know, uncovering this type of value within all of these layers of information? Uh, I mean, to me, it seems like it can be something um, at a governmental level that needs to be introduced so that uh, this is a constant, uh, you know, um, so that it becomes a constant uh, going back type of cycle that happens and that is accessible to uh, you know some the interest of the public so that there's this revisiting process that happens and this uncovering process that these you know gems that come up within the uh, revisiting process are uncovered so my question basically is 
how to tap into this value because honestly as we are going through the art cutting process and you know these things don't come up until we revisit them later on I was just about to ask the same question because uh, we were doing a research a few months ago and we went to Bahrain airport and the archive they have is from the 80s and that's only because they had an architect who's from the Philippines who decided to keep the documents. Everything before that is no, is no longer there, which I found very fascinating that the only reason they had an archive or they found value in it because one person decided to start archiving it, you know, rather than having it as something that, uh, you know, you know that it has value to it from the beginning. Anyone's willing to answer this? Um, so as far as starting archiving and sort of getting people interested in it, um, I can speak for a little bit, Annie, what I know about Kuwait is, um, and perhaps Zahra Ali Baba would have been better at sort of answering this question. Um, at a government level, at an institutional level, in Kuwait, for example, we have these um, entities such as the Kuwait National Council for Culture, Arts and Letters. We have Diwan al-Amiri, who has its own sort of archival initiative that's, that was started in um, 1984, I believe, um, yeah, under, under Sheikh Jabir, yani, may rest in peace. So we have these things at an institutional level, but then it's not enough to have it also at an institutional level because they, yani, um, it's very hard to sort of predict value of a document right now. So let's say for me, for my research, it was only when I was looking back and in retrospect and looking at all of the information I was able to find, was I truly able to sort of weave the story through all of the documents I was able to find. Now, someone at an institutional level whose interest would not have been conservation or architecture or what have you, might not have been able to piece or, or to sort of envision the significance of each individual document. So I, again, it's this idea of sort of being careful about sort of picking or choosing what we save and I definitely argue we should save everything even I mean especially now that we're in a digital age everything doesn't have this huge physical space you know where you can't argue I don't have room for this because of course we do um, and sort of another issue is sort of to get let's say our students more interested in it as well um, we're, I think I gather we're mostly architects here but to get us in the habit and the students in the habit of sort of saving their work and documenting their portfolios and that sort of grows into something with their research and eventually with their workplace and governments and entities I mean it should be their duty of course to save all of the history of their nations because essentially they are really custodians of all of these histories for future generations. They do not own it and they do should not be able to sort of have the right to demolish it or erase it completely from history. It is it is there to be saved for future generation, generations. So maybe um, a student 20 or 20 something years from now will be able to find the research and what we presented here today and use that for something more significant, let's say. Um, yeah. Uh, just to go back to your question, um, I think it's a role that is one is by the government um, at a certain level, private um, uh, office, uh, practices and offices as well, in addition to individual and not-for-profit organization. All of these should come together. You'd have different types of archives at different levels, providing, as you said, a different sort of angle at looking at this, at this information. And the only way to unlock the value from all this information actually archived is by the interest of researchers who would review these archives. And that and how this is how they keep sort of going through them, building on the archives, and adding to it moving forward. That's it. Anyway. OK, we'll take the last comment from uh, Ali, and then we'll end the session. Is he, hmm? Does anyone else have a question? No? OK. Well, uh. Actually, I, I don't have a question, but I want to throw something for your discussions. You take Al Khudr, for instance. Al Khudr, it is a legacy in the people. It's not mentioned in the Quran. No, no, no. It's mentioned as Abd Saleh. We don't know who is his name. People make this. If you go all the Muslims, you will find a Khudr. Even here in Bahrain, we have the Khudr. 
This is a product of ignorance. Uh, uh, we should not uh, take it now. Uh, it will be forgotten with uh, with the education, with understanding uh, religion uh, clearly as it was in the uh, prophet uh, times. Uh, not uh, taking opinions of uh, uh, who let bit uh, miss away from uh, from uh, the people. This is one point I want you to think about it. Uh, something we, we we find it in the research. We find it, in the, but how we uh, understand it, how we appreciate it, how we utilize it. Uh, this uh, we had to take stance against uh, something, uh, especially want to develop our our uh, presence to make a history. Uh, I have a point for for you. In the West, architecture is uh, continuous, never have been interrupted. Our architecture, uh, it was com uh, suddenly stopped, uh, and a new line, uh, I say modern with uh, tags, uh, go on. Now, how we make our past, where we stop, uh, we start uh, uh, producing, make products, make our modern, which we produce, not the modern we uh, import from outside. The one we import uh, always have alienation problem, always have uh, this. If you look for the, you give a mention of in the Tokyo about the about the station and uh, and the mosque in, uh, in Cairo. Uh, religion in, in Islam, it is an investment. If you see uh, God about uh, Sadaqah, he say, who invest uh, with us, who give me a loan? And there is the prophets with, with uh, practicing uh, uh, Islam. The problem of mosques now, it's a very big problem. We make uh, huge mosques, uh, very expensive, a lot of uh, uh, landscaping about it, and we use them only 25 minutes in a day. Each prayer five minutes and then it closed. But if you go to Spain, which is not Muslims, they inherit a lot of mosques. See the open spaces around it. It is a livable space. Uh, people use it, people live in it produce commerce, produce life. Uh, it is the, uh, the problem is with the mentality of people, not with the, uh, the building of the mosque itself. Uh, uh, we can uh, handle how we revitalize mosque, how we give mosque more uh, social activities, more, more of these uh, uh, things along this line. Also, uh, Ali Karimi, hear, hear me? Yeah, uh, hello Ali, good uh, research, but uh, in your uh, research, you start housing with the uh, Beautiful Ammad al Muharraq. Actually, housing started before, maybe with Ammal, it is uh, completely government, but there was initiative from uh, uh, people, like uh, there is a project for al in, uh, in near uh, near the uh, Jafari uh, cemetery, uh, it is built a housing. It has its layout. It is uh, earlier than uh, al Amman. Also, some private like uh, Kano family, Yatim family, they started in the 50s making cambot. They have uh, certain uh, user, maybe some uh, experts who come at that time uh, in Bahrain to residents, but they are type of uh, uh, housing scheme affected how uh, housing is treated here. How, uh, uh, they, uh, they should be mentioned on your uh, uh, study. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. Uh, 
none of the points were to me, which is good, so, but I'm just going <laughs> to answer the others. Um, I think whether it was Al-Khadr or any other uh, topic, I think we have here a challenge, with, which is with archiving. We have a lot of oral history here in the, in the Gulf that has, been t uh, has to be documented and should be documented, whether it's a myth, whether it's a real story. These things are part of our culture, are part of our history. Um, and that and that's sort of debatable. That also leads me to the next point, which is archiving or the information you find in archives. It really depends on who collects these archives and how selectively puts these bits and pieces. And that's another challenge that is, even if you document oral history, you can omit certain things, you can include other stuff, and you can sort of always alter and change. Unless you save the recording of it in our uh, digital unless age. You totally, yeah, unless you save the recording now, now in this day and age, yeah. So yeah, also if, um, just a comment as well. Um, with the issue of Al Khadr, I think um, my place, let's say, as as I am, I am a practicing Muslim. Visually, you can tell that um, the issue of Al Khadr it does raise a lot of uh, problems. Let's say not everyone believes of this site, not everyone believes in the story or the legend. It is not my place nor anybody else's as an architect, especially one who focuses on conservation issues, to dismiss anyone else's belief when I'm collecting research and information. When it comes to, I mean, my research really is focused towards the future of Felicia and sort of the development of the island itself. In order for me to understand how this island is going to move forward and develop in a physical way, I have to understand the culture of the island as well, the mentality of the people that work there, the urban fabric of, uh, of the island. And in that case, um, to them, this is a place that is important. So it is not my place, whether I believe in it or not, to dismiss it or to erase it from a history. This is a discussion, I mean, this is sort of an issue, and this is, in a sense, something that we have to fight in this day and age, where there is this culture and attitude where anything that is pre-Islamic is, in a way, unimportant, and unless it is Western. So on the island itself, we also have a temple to the goddess Artemis. It is a Grecian goddess, and it's part of Greek mythology, yet no one ever seems to have a problem with saving that because it is a Western history, let's say, although it is pre-Islamic. I mean, it is, uh, and the same goes sort of with Al Khadr. Al Khadr, even if you don't believe in the history of itself, and it's a, a, a personal choice, I would say, for, for anyone who wants to or doesn't, we cannot sort of ignore that it is significant to the people of the island and also globally because this person, as a legend, has um, parallels in different religions. It has parallels that are mentioned in the Bible, in the Torah, in Hinduism even. People believe in this figure. They all have different names for him, but the journeys sort of meet and the stories align somehow. So this sort of becomes an issue. And things that are pre-Islamic in this region are also important. And just because I don't believe them doesn't mean I have the right to erase them, let's say. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll have Ali commenting on something. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, for you said that there was uh, other forms of housing, like you mentioned, Lauqaf. There was also the kind of beginning of the oil company housing. There was also the housing for the British and uh, the nuns in the church. I mean, there's other forms of housing, which I would say are maybe similar or at least similar models or similar kind of economic models. But for me, the the, the Maniyat uh, al-Amal is maybe the first um, kind of quote-unquote government-built housing with, with the particular ob objectives, or at least the beginning objectives, of a welfare state. Uh, and if you talk to people in the Ministry of Housing, I don't think they would even consider it until they'd say, oh, yeah, like Isa Town is really the first, like the beginning of it. Um, so Maniyat al-Amal is maybe a bit more debatable. But uh, your, po your point is completely valid. It's just for me, because it was built by the municipality and not a religious group or um, and the idea the idea really of a state constructing it is, is why I thought it was important. But uh, I completely agree that yes, there's other narratives in the in that of uh, government built housing Bahrain. 
to go to the first two points uh, and the question of archiving, and I think a lot of uh, Nora uh, covered it beautifully, and a lot of the other speakers as well. But I think really it's 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 um, national issue, um, which is obvious. But for example, in the case of the Kuwait Pavilion, a lot of what we wanted to do could not have been done unless we were doing it with Kuwait. I mean, if you want to tell, if you want to say, and they asked us, they're like, why don't you, why doesn't Saudi Arabia or Bahrain or Qatar do this pavilion? Why does it have to be Kuwait? And our answer was like, and what other what other Gulf country would agree to having Iranian participation or presenting uh, these contested islands as a chance for cooperation? And if you say that in Emirates, if you say that anywhere else, and you, people would just say no. You're, you're especially with the timing. And co- this is we got confirmation in January when uh, Gulf co- governments were pulling out their ambassadors from Iran, and there's all these moments of tension. But uh, I think really our issue is, and it goes along with the problem of archiving, it's ma- not only is, is there an issue with archiving, but really we have an issue with, all, and, and actually this goes back to the housing question, we really have an issue with, uh, with, different, public institu- with different institutions other than government. I mean, the government has its own, uh, does its own work, it has its own interests, it has its own cultural agenda, it has its own um, social agenda, and and, uh, it com- and it's completely entitled to it. And and th- I mean, I'm comparing this to the U.S., to, to Europe, to Belgium, to Chile. We really have a lack of alternate venues for uh, alternate narratives, alternate uh, exercises, and ways of showing other information. And I don't mean to say that uh, there's minority interests that the government lacks. It's not that at all. But I'm saying, if you're a if you're a Bahraini or a Jidawi or a person from Riyadh or whatever. And you're looking to fund, uh, if you're looking to archive Sheraton hotels around the Gulf, who do you apply to for funding? Who do you present that work at? I mean, maybe you work with a Rawab, maybe you contact Bin Laden group, maybe, I mean, there's these opportunities, but there's such there's such personal to personal matters that, it, that I think really the larger issue is that we don't have institutional frameworks where people can find ways of, of documenting things of their interest. I mean, you see it to some, some extent through the University of Bahrain and through universities that KU does, does it in some places and people involved with KU. Um, the Bahraini government does it. Uh, Bobco, to some extent, does it. Like different companies do it. But really, I, I think, I, I mean, I, I mean there's, there's no particular answer. But I would say maybe for me the biggest issue is there's not as much investment from uh, the private sector and from alternate ways of funding and encouraging cultural activity. I mean, if you want to publish an interesting book in the U.S., your immediate thing is, oh, let me go to the Graham Foundation. We don't really have those those channels in Bahrain. And if you want to publish a book, okay, maybe you'll talk to this person, that person. Um, but I think I think really for me, the arch- issue of archiving comes part and parcel with really do we have the network to to allow intellectual capacity to be produced. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Ali. I don't know how much of that went through. Uh, yeah, final comments from. Yeah, I wanted to actually. It's a question to the organizers of, of why they chose uh, this image to for the event. I'm curious. The poster. Okay, so we need to ask because uh, it says urban archiving and. The poster is in the middle of a landscape, a desert landscape. It's not so urban. <laughs> so Zara would be the best person to talk about it. Unfortunately, she twisted her leg. Hope she gets better soon. Um, so she designed it in this way, basically. Um, so she's um, started Dokumamo Kuwait, where she's documenting modern buildings in Kuwait and modern heritage. And she comes from a place of the lack of archives and the lack of, you know, this void in history um, and void, and in Kuwait specifically, um, the the old city is destructed and you only have the mosques as uh, kind of have characteristics of what used to be. So people usually have the urban memory around where the mosques are located. So you get a lot of oral history from where Kuwait, uh, the mosques are. So um, I, I'm just guessing it's like basically this emptiness just represents this. You know, like this void in history, that uh, lack of documentation, basically. Uh, this is a still from a movie called uh, Atmosphere by uh, English uh, artist Graham Stevens, who experimented with uh, pneumatic structures and 
uh, membrane structures in the 70s. And uh, in 1983, he was invited by the Hajj Research Center to present a proposal for a, a shaded walkway from Mina to Arafah, which unfortunately was not realized. Uh, I was just curious uh, if he did any work in, in Kuwait but, uh, or in Bahrain. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming. So we'll. Uh, hmm? Do you. Huh? It is the. the yeah, I, I could bar barely hear the conversation. Uh, but maybe if I can add just a final thank you to uh, the Moana team. And I mean, I think there was a question about the value of archives and how can they then become sort of, um, um, how can they then be initiatives led by the government and state-led mandates. And I think what's happening with Moana is an, ex an example of how different people, different efforts of archives can come together and familiarize their materials. Um, to, to a wider public, but also um, efforts such as the um, exercise of the Kuwait Pavilion led by uh, Ali and Hamid, again, brought together people from different places in the region, um, sort of responding to a specific theme, but in different ways about different material and different sort of contexts. And I think the Okay, we'll just wrap it up then. Or let's just try one more time. Just try uh, audio. Yeah. We can hear you. No. Okay. Hello? Fatma? Yes, we can hear you. Just uh, continue okay. what you're saying. You got cut off. I switched my phone, so um, I don't know where. Where did I? Where did it stop? <laughs> you were talking yeah. about Moana bringing all of the archival efforts together. Oh, that's where it stopped. Okay, it's, it's just a thank you note to Moana and to mention that, um, I mean, this is what we need. This is exactly what we need, initiatives such as Moana, but also exercises such as the one that Ali, Karimi, and Hamid led for the Kuwait Pavilion, where um, it's not a sort of, uh, it's not an effort of a single entity or a single group of people, but it's the combination of different efforts and different sort of um, ways in which material is being, material along the region is being sort of uh, generated uh, to come together and to make us all familiar with each other's work. I think that's the best way of really bringing out the value of such archival material and making it available to everyone and having such discussions of, of, of at the caliber um, of what we're having right now. I think that's where the value of such information is. Okay, thank you, Fatma. And thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Suha, for organizing all of this and for the hard efforts of the team of uh, Moana uh, as well. Uh, so we'll wrap it up here. Thank you.